Okay, so I guess it's time to start. Uh, welcome to this event. My name is Jukka Laitinen, and uh, I'm acting as a, a lead software engineer and architect in Secure Autonomous Drones project in Secure Systems Research Center, Technology Innovation Institute. And today I'm talking about uh, drone security and specifically security in PX4 autopilot system. Uh, so these are my to topics today. First, I will give a short introduction about why I think security is really crucial and important for all of us to take into account very shortly. Uh, then I will uh, go through some of the security challenges with current off-the-shelf flight controllers. And the main topic is uh, how we have added some uh, security features into the PX4 autopilot in SSRC, specifically uh, added memory protection, crypto interfaces, and signed boot support. And then finally, I will give a glimpse of our uh, secure RISC V based flight controller hardware, uh, which we have also ported PX4 and Natex on, on it. Okay, first about the security focus. Why, why do we need to care about the security? So this is nothing new to anyone listening to this presentation. Uh, so the number of drones in the world is growing exponentially. Uh, this is really fast growing business. And there are new uh, use cases invented for drones all the time. Uh, some of those use cases were presented by doc Dr. Lawrence Meyer and, and uh, my boss, Dr. Diki Takar in his speech later on. And at the same time, when the number of drones is growing, the existing drone system really suffer from different security, safety, and privacy issues. Uh, and the mo most obvious threats are the same as they have been for years al already. So mm, the drones can be hijacked by attacking the radio channels uh, or hacking uh, into Wi-Fi of a companion computer of the drone and, and so on. And other uh, really uh, big threat is stealing sensitive information out of the drone. So if the drone gets into wrong hands, uh, it contains all the photos and video feeds and, and everything. And it, it can really be something that needs to be protected to protect people's privacy and uh, even safety. Um, now, if we want to, and why would, why would we want to enable the security features directly into the, for example, PX4 platform? Uh, simply because uh, anybody who makes a product out of uh, PX4 or any other drone platform will need to take security into consideration. And it's actually huge work to implement all the security features. So implementing it straight into the PX4 will make drone development easier for anyone using PX4. And it will also draw attention to the security needs. So when there are those features available, people maybe start thinking that why they are there and maybe I should use them and so on. And ultimately, uh, we will increase the safety, public safety in general when there are less unsecured drones flying. Uh, I will just give one example how easy it is to attack um, drone radios. Just five years ago, there was a, a software-defined de radio product made by or, or uh, test equipment made by uh, security researcher Jonathan Anderson, who called it Icarus. And uh, that device could capture any drone using Spectrum DSM radio link or RC in less than a second. And the same mechanism for using a software defend, defined radios can be used still today. And then there are other means of attacking Wi Fi and those other stuff. But I guess that's enough for, the, for this topic. Now I will jump straight into PX4. And even though I'm saying that this is about security challenges in current PX4 based flight controllers, this actually applies to other open source flight controllers as well and many proprietary ones, which I have seen too. Now, uh, this is a very simplified architecture picture of uh, PX4 system. 
there are some of the common components like Mavlink and Logger and Kalman filter and Commander and those, and then the PX4 drivers and Natex kernel and drivers. And now when you start making a secure product out of it or adding security to this, to this uh, you will start identifying the attack surface and start thinking about how, how the system can be attacked. And you will soon realize that um, this attack surface is actually quite large. It's very hard to even imagine all the ways how you could attack this software. Uh, I have marked here a couple of very obvious things that you need to uh, consider when you are uh, starting to make this more secure. But a good idea might be that instead of only trying to identify the attack surface, um, you take something from zero trust architectures and also try to uh, identify the actual product surface. So, for example, if you want to, uh, let's look at the logger, for example. It's storing log files, plain text into an SD card on a flight controller that you can buy out of a shop, off the shelf flight controller. And same does the dataman component. So it's storing your mission items on an SD card, also in plain text format. And those files tell anybody who gets their hands on those files, what has the drone been doing uh, and where it was going next and, and so on, which, which can be information that needs to be protected. Another thing is, uh, of course, capturing the telemetry link. You might have a telemetry radio uh, transmitting Mavlink directly to your ground station, or you could route the Mavlink through your companion computer. And uh, you start thinking that maybe if you just add a, a telemetry radio with, with that encryption, then you are safe. Or, or maybe you think that the Mavlink cannot be accessed if it just goes through your companion computer and via some Wi-Fi link to somewhere else. Uh, this is typically not quite so simple. So if you really want to protect, um, for example, log files or dataman files, a good idea is actually to encrypt the file itself and keep the private key for decryption out of the drone completely in some, some safe, safe place. Then it doesn't anymore matter if the file gets accessed by some outsider, but it will just appear as garbage. And same goes with the Mavlink. Uh, if you, uh, for example, sign the Mavlink packets coming from the ground control station to your drone, your drone can only uh, respond to commands that are coming from a trusted source. Uh, and again, if your drone is sending out Mavlink, uh, it could encrypt that so that if anybody intercepts that traffic by any means, it will just appear as garbage and doesn't mean anything to, to the attacker. Um, now, so we have identified that you will need some, some encryption capabilities to make this safer. Mm. Now there is a huge problem here. So if you add uh, uh, crypto algorithms or keys in here, uh, you soon realize that all of these components are actually running in a single unprotected memory space within your flight controller, which means that uh, they are all subject to uh, data exfiltration or yeah, memory corruption. If there is bug in any of those other components or somebody is sending some ill-formed messages via some communication channel or any other way. And... Um, but the more you think about it, uh, you will realize that without adding some kind of hardware-assisted memory protection, you cannot really make a safe product uh, out of this kind of traditional computer architecture, because this is already quite big and complex uh, thing. There's lots of software involved. And I have, I have always also, so now, now we have identified that you will need uh, encryption and you will need uh, memory protection there to make it safer. You will probably also need some deep loading. Uh, I have marked uh, Natex shell there, typically uh, off the shelf PX4 um, flight controller. They, uh, for example, execute a script during boot up directly from SD card if the script happens to be there. So anybody can, can put any script on the SD card and it gets executed. Or you might have a uh, 
remove the debug connector from your uh, product, but left some UART pads there on the PCB or, or such. So, so deep loading is one thing that you, you will always need to do as well. But at least those three things you will need to take care of. And now I will move a little bit forward and look at the hard, typical hardware that is used nowadays. So these off-the-shelf flight controllers are built typically around uh, microcontrollers, uh, which are not really, they are great, but they are not really meant for making a secure drone product, which is very complicated and big software. Uh, those uh, top-end flight controllers currently are using STM32F and H-class uh, microcontrollers, and they typically don't have uh, hardware accelerated encryption or signing mechanisms. Uh, some models of STMs do have those, but typically you lack the software support, so it's pretty much useless. Um, typically there is no secure storage of any kind, but uh, the security of any secrets relies on uh, putting the secrets in the, into flash and using some readout protection mechanism in those. And then there is low CPU powers. You, you can't really add any software-based cryptography or uh, machine learning stuff or anything like that into the flight controller. And then there is a MPU for memory protection, which is great uh, for a firmware that is very static and you can easily sort of pre-allocate all the memory areas there, what is where and what needs to be protected. But this in this kind of um, large dynamic product project where you have got a full operating system and you are dynamically launching threads, allocating stacks for those and using dynamic memory allocation and stuff like that, MPU is really hard to use. It requires that you align your uh, data carefully and uh, and so on. Well, enough of those microcontrollers. Uh, they are great, maybe not great for secure drone, but still. But also in the off-the-shelf flight controllers, you don't typically have ways to uh, protect from uh, device tampering. So there is no tamper protection. There is no mechanism to create trust between the main flight controller and peripherals. And I already talked about the telemetry and RC radios earlier. So that kind of things at least you can find in the hardware. So um, moving forward, we started to tackle some of those problems in software in, in PX4 in, in SSRC because we are building our own secure drone um, uh, software base. And uh, uh, this year we have worked on these three things. So we have enabled memory protection, uh, some level of it uh, that works also on those STM chips and the current microcontrollers. Uh, uh, we have uh, implemented some crypto interfaces into PX4 firmware that, so that you can actually do cryptography from the modules like Logger and Dataman and those, those ones. And we have um, also enabled signed boot support. Um, Dr. Tiki Takaro already mentioned this in his presentation earlier, but now I'm going through these three ones in, in detail one by one. Well, at least give an overview of them, maybe not in detail. So <clears throat> this is the memory protection picture. Natex protected build means that uh, the memory space and application are divided in two categories. Uh, some of them are running in user space and any component running in user space can only access the memory of other user space components. So they are restricted inside the user space here. Then the trusted components can be put into the kernel space and anything running in, in the kernel space can access uh, all the memory in the system, including the hardware registers and stuff like that. And uh, now we can more safely put our crypto in place because we can put our crypto in the kernel space and it will be isolated from, uh, for example, Mavlink running here or some other components that are less trusted. So Mavlink cannot directly access the memory of our cryptography anymore. Um, 
how this works then is that we didn't actually modify any of those uh, modules, at least not much. Um, but they are remain the same. Same. But um, the thing what we did was that uh, these things uh, communicate with with each other via micro orb interface, uh, which is a central piece in PX4 architecture, and we created a micro orb user interface here. It, it implements, implements the same functions than the actual micro orb that is running entirely in kernel space. So we just link all these applications against this micro orb user interface in the user land. And uh, now they can work through the micro orb just the same as before. But uh, this actually works through a call gate through this IOCTL interface to the kernel side. So there is a defined interface now via which these guys work with the micro orb. And, and we did the same for some other things like high resolution timer. And, and uh, actually there is also in crypto backend, there is this interface present. And the idea in this is really that we didn't change much and we didn't break any of the existing functionality. And we just changed the build scripts and the linking of the components mostly and added these user interfaces on this side. Uh, and now these modules can be actually moved uh, from the user space to kernel space. For example, if uh, you want to increase flight resiliency, you could move also the estimators and controllers to kernel space, which in theory gives you the possibility that you can even shut down the user space completely and reboot it uh, in extreme case. But uh, well, that's more theory. And we are not leaving this memory protection exercise here, but we will also continue with uh, implementing the memory protection using full MMU, at least internal, internally in SSRC. So we will be utilizing Natex kernel build and run each module as a lightweight process. The picture will be pretty much the same as before, but uh, in addition, now every component in the user side is uh, separated from each other as well. The kernel side stays pretty much the same. And uh, now the problem is, of course, that this is not do doable with any of the current flight controller, ha controller hardware because there is no MMU in there. So we will require some MMU capable hardware and more memory and also some more CPU power. But I will come back to this later in this presentation. Then the second thing that we added here uh, was the crypto interfaces. So this is a three layer interface. On the lowest layer here, uh, we have a crypto backend and we defined an interface for crypto backend. And the idea here is that um, you can implement your own crypto in here. If you have a hardware accelerated crypto available or you have some secure element you can just create your own implementation here, which just implements this in same interface. And it's a, it is then just a plugin to this system. And in the middle layer, we have got an operating system dependent layer. And the main reason, uh, for example, in Natex build here is to actually implement the call gates in, in memory protected build. So, um, when you are accessing crypto from uh, from the modules, you can you want to go all the way through to the kernel side to actually run actually run the implementation on the kernel side. But in this operating system dependent layer, you can also do other stuff like uh, if the operating system is uh, giving you, for example, random number generator or some other stuff that you need for the crypto, you can take them into use here. And this layer also defines the actual uh, interface towards the applications, which is a C++ class, um, which uh, has just some basic functions to encrypt and decrypt and sign and do signature check and create keys and stuff like that. And you can just use this interface in your component like Mowling or Logger or any other module or application in PX4. And really the idea is that you can use the crypto on high level and you don't need to care about on which operating system it runs on or what is the actual uh, backend implementation for the cryptography. 
so uh, going to another operating system or going to another um, hardware, uh, you don't need to change the, your modules. And the third thing that I wanted to present here was this um, side boot support. And uh, this is actually quite simple. Uh, this is um, um, basically what happens here is that you just tell the build script that you are um, you want the image to be signed, and build script calls a signing script that adds a signature to your uh, image. And in addition, you will be adding a table of content here, um, which tells the bootloader then when the device is booting that, uh, what to do with each part of this firmware. So in the simplest case, you will have just the PX4 firmware here, and you will have a signature here, and then two descriptors in the table of content, one telling that the firmware starts here and it, it is of this size, uh, and bootloader should use this key to verify the signature, and the signature can be found in this descriptor, and this other descriptor will then tell that the signature is in here and of, is of this size, and maybe something needs to be done to that before, and so on. And uh, this signed boot support is actually implemented for the old bootloader that resides in the bootloader repository, or for the older flight controllers, and it's also implemented for the NATEX-based newer bootloaders, for example, for the STM32H7-based uh, flight controllers. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much about the signed boot support. And now I, I want to present our uh, RISC-V-based flight controller project, which is really cool. So um, as I mentioned before, we want we saw some um, drawbacks in current flight controllers, and we want to en enable some applied research and, and research with the secure flight controllers, and we want to give some more tools to do this. So we took this MicroSemi Polar Fire SOC, RISC-V, SOC, which is really performant, 64-bit, four-core beast, uh, which does all the cryptography functions that we might need. It has got the memory protection. It has got four, four application-grade uh, CPUs with MMU. It has got the hardware-accelerated cryptography. Actually, the MicroSemi promises this to be defense-grade security. It has, it has got root of trust and tamper protection, all of these things. And uh, uh, because it's totally overkill for just running a flight controller, uh, we can put flight controller on just one of those application grade cores. And there will be three other cores free. And there is a mechanism that we can actually run Linux and ROS2 even on those remaining three cores. So we can make a full flight controller controller plus companion computer uh, thing with this single SOC high security device. And it has even got an FPGA for more advanced features. And uh, for example, we have added some, um, we have also added, added some legacy stuff there like VWM blocks for running the motors. Um, most of the stuff, uh, most of the buses and stuff that we need is actually already there in the in the SOC. And uh, this is also all public uh, work, uh, at least the basic port of this uh, NATEX and PX4 for, for this uh, Polar Fire. So you can find it in this GitHub link. And by the way, in this presentation, there are many slides that I'm not now showing because of the time, but you can look into those later after the presentation. Uh, so, uh, we took the, actually the big development board and pulled it that, that directly to a Holy Pro X500 frame, just because we wanted to make a, uh, our software de development platform uh, flying already. And uh, this was, okay, it's the size of an airfleet carrier, but uh, well, it's, it was quite fun to do this. So there, <laughs> there is 
actually another board uh, underneath this, which has got uh, six Hawk five, six Hawk four uh, type connectors and some basic set of sensors. It just doesn't show on this picture. And uh, uh, yeah, it has got the basic Pixhawk GPS module and uh, all this uh, basic uh, uh, X500 uh, motors and the X and everything. So, and it's a flyable software development platform. The thing up here is actually our companion computer, or mission computer, as we call it, and we use that for running our secure ROS2 environment and machine learning and hypervisor stuff and whatnot, other things, but I'm not going into that in, in this presentation, but I'm sticking into PX4 side, which is all in here. And now I will just show it its first slide. It does some twitches. I'm doing those actually with RC controller myself, giving it just small step input inputs to see how it behaves. And it's also badly tuned, but it's the first flight, so it's always fun to see something flying for the first time. So I want to share share it with you. Right. That was that was cool. At least it was really cool when we did that for the first time. Now uh, we are not leaving the hardware side in there, so we will continue on that, and uh, we will take a next next step. So we have ordered some uh, system on, on modules from RES embedded, which is a small embedded module containing the Polar Fire S SOC FPGA and memories and some other stuff needed for to run it. And we are designing our, our own custom carrier board, which contains then the uh, FMU V5 X compatible connectors and some ethernet connector and basic set of sensors and then a connector for a same sensor board that is used in, in uh, those FMU devices. And then we will wrap it up with some mechanics to make it a real uh, research uh, capable, uh, nice flight controller, flight controller unit. So this will be about size of approximately five times, five times 10 centimeters and few centimeters high, uh, high box, which is then capable of running uh, PX4 on Natex and Linux at the same time, or just one of those and uh, gives us really good opportunities to do all kinds of applied research on top of it. And on the right side, there is um, a block diagram of this um, SOC. So you can see what all is there available in the SOC. So it's really, really cool thing. So um, I think I'm one minute ahead. I will stop here. Thank you. And um, to participate in security development in PX4, please, uh, if you have something to contribute, please come to the Drone Code Security Special Interest Group. Uh, it's a group uh, that is specific, specifically looking at the security things in PX4. And if you have any questions about this presentation, you probably have. Um, there are already some questions I will address those soon. Um, uh, let's talk about this after this presentation now, and you can always contact me in PX4 Slack and by email. My email address is here. Okay, so thank you. And now let's go to the questions and answers. Um, yeah. Michael is, uh, Michael, Michael's comments, yeah. That's, yeah, thanks for the comment. And there is a question about um, 
key for the image verification of the boot image is stored in the secure storage element according to your schematic. Where exactly is this element? Okay, so this is a good question. Um, on some of the later latest um, FMU designs, there is actually a secure element specified. Uh, that uh, schematic was uh, a conceptual one. Uh, for image verification, you don't actually even need to have a, a, any private or private secret there. So for verification, you will only need a public key. And uh, basically, you can do this already by embedding your public key into your code and then just making sure that it doesn't get changed by, by an outsider. So, uh, so you need to protect the public key from changing, but uh, so you can do this by embedding the public keys into the code. But, but in our uh, upcoming uh, RISC-V exercises, we will have a storage for those and there will be a secure element also in some new FMU designs. Uh, does the IOCTL interface for microorb add an overhead? Yes, it does. Um, uh, and uh, well, you can avoid some of the overhead by putting those components uh, which use the very high frequency sensor data into all into the kernel space, then they are linked directly uh, to the microorb in kernel side. But yeah, this is one thing that I was mentioning that uh, we will need some more CPU power to do full-fledged memory protection that, that's granted. Mm. Uh, and Michael is asking about the same thing about the computational load. Do you have a chance to compare the plus in terms of consumption? Uh, yeah, so the uh, memory protection build using the NATEX protect this build can be executed by anyone. So uh, it runs on Pixhawk 4 hardware already. So you can uh, you can just try it out and it can be measured, but yeah, it, it is more heavy. But uh, even uh, the performance of STM is enough to run it with some reduced sensor set. So, um, with a little bit more CPU power, it's fully doable. And does encrypting the ULOC can work without need for full encryption of the firmware? What are the overheads? Um, encrypting the ULOC works in a way that is, it is using uh, Judge a 20 algorithm for encrypting the data. That is a symmetric, very lightweight crypto algorithm, but then as it is a symmetric key algorithm, uh, you will need to somehow exchange the symmetric key. So it works so that when you start the logging, it, it actually generates the uh, uh, private key with um, random number generator, and it's not storing that anywhere, but it resides only in the memory, and in protected field, it will, would reside only in the kernel side memory. And then you, uh, exchange a key by encrypting that key with RSA and storing that encrypted key uh, on SD card uh, so that uh, when you take out the encrypted uh, ULOG and en encrypted shared key, uh, you can decrypt them later then with your private keys which are not in the drone. So, so yeah, you can do that without full encryption of the firmware. And the overhead is actually quite small. It adds some um, five to 10% of CPU load when you do the encryption with the, with the Chacha 20, or it's actually X Chacha, so it's using 24 byte nonce values, but yeah. Uh, could you, Matthew, a little bit tell more about the question, is that board available for download? So, so which board? Are you referring to? Are you referring to code some board uh, configuration for PX4 or or hardware schematics or or what?
yeah, the Risk Five hardware. Um, yeah, so the software is download lo, downloadable. It's in public GitHub. Uh, the hardware that I showed flying is only uh, um, Microsemi Polar Fire Icicle development board. So that is something that you can buy uh, buy from anywhere. So it's it's public and you can buy, just go out and buy it. Uh, the sensor port that we added to that is uh, that we made by, by ourselves. Uh, it is a small board that looks like this, and but it doesn't have anything but a couple of sensors attached to the SPI and I2C, and, uh, and then those connectors. So there is nothing strange there. But I cannot answer whether the hardware schematics will be available or, or not. But the software is all there. Uh, yeah, for William, um, uh, just just Google for Icarus Icarus software defined radio. You will find information about that. It's somewhat old, but you will find more links about the topic. And I, I think I also added some links to the presentation. Just one thing that came to my mind, there seem to be no more questions, but still about uh, uh, security need for drones. I just remember one incident. It was an accident, though, but it was just uh, six years ago when I was watching some. Uh, it was a World Cup slalom event, and there was a drone carrying a big and heavy television camera falling down, almost hitting one of the skier. It was, I believe it was Marshall Hirscher who was almost hit by the drone. And uh, it was a scary event. And even more scary is that that kind of things could be intentional. So uh, it's a real threat to the safety if the drones are not well protected. Okay, let's see if there are more. Ah, about the plus in battery power consumption over the mission time. Uh, I would say that that's insignificant. In, in a drone system, uh, at least in those larger drones, uh, the motors and are are eating so much more power than than the uh, microcontroller that it 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 probably doesn't make a much difference. It's probably measurable, but we haven't done that. But it's a good point. There, there might be some, especially if the drone is very small and, and the power drawn by the microcontroller is high compared to the uh, motors. But I'm not really a hardware guy, so I can't say any specific numbers there.
Okay, but if there are any more questions coming, uh, please just uh, you may send me email or you may contact me afterwards. I won't probably be uh, in this um, summit all the way through because it's getting quite late here already. It's almost midnight. Uh, so I will be back in the summit tomorrow then. So thank you all.